Thank you for joining the ones changing the world. India's first future tech meets sustainability podcast. And today I'm delighted and honored to have with me Mr. Ben Kirksey, who is an American anthropologist who specializes on science and justice. He's a speaker, teacher and writer who has authored various books including Inside the Global Race to Genetically Modify Humans, The Mutant Project. <laughs> Welcome to the show. So Thanks for why, having me. Yeah, why don't we start with a brief introduction and then while you are at it, maybe you can also explain what biotech and genetic uh, engineering is. Uh, yeah, so, so this book is about uh, a new suite of uh, uh, genetic technologies that are editing DNA. So DNA is, um, you know, kind of the, <clears throat> the basis for making, making life and um, there's a new set of tools that is uh, more precise than earlier genetic engineering tools for targeting a specific gene. And um, what gene editing is really good at doing is breaking that gene. So if, if you have a, a gene that you don't want, these tools are good for deleting it. So thank you for explaining what gene editing and what it does. You know, I mean, like you said, it's it's almost like the source code alive. We've got some 4 billion plus pairs of DNA and, and that DNA, the way it expresses, makes us who we are. You know, it gives us all our, our qualities, you know, or, and even our health conditions, current and possibly the, the future. And we are just exploring the language, language of understanding what it is and then possibly harnessing uh, the genetics uh, or genomics understanding for for uh, healthcare. Now your book is, is titled Mutant Project, which is possibly in the far out distance. You know when we actually completely understand the language of you know what it means to do these precise snipping, editing, pasting, adding a, a, a certain genome, and that's when possibly we'll get into a world we'll have actually have mutants like the ones we see in X Men. But that's like really really in the distant future. But the your book is provocatively titled The Mutant Project. So would you like to talk a little bit more about that and what does the book uh, hold and say? Yeah, so so let's um, uh, break it down a little bit. So the gene editing tools that I just mentioned, um, in particular CRISPR-Cas9, technically create mutants. So um, in, in, in sort of technical terms, what CRISPR does is create targeted mutagenesis. That means you go into a part of the genome and you scramble things. Um, a mutation is, is just a change. And with CRISPR, you can target those changes. Um, some things would be relatively easy to do. Um, and you know the book uh, chronicles the emergence of, of the world's first genetically modified people. A lot of the experiments have been focused on uh, disabling a particular pathway or receptor that the virus HIV uses to get inside of cells. But you can you can also change a lot of things about um, you know the human condition that can have some pretty dramatic effects. For example, you can take out the gene myostatin and end up with a child that has massive muscles that looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger at, at the age of, of five. Um, but most genes have serious trade-offs. Um, so if you take out myostatin, um, you not only will have big muscles, but you're likely to have a child with smaller organs and heart problems. And the same goes for, for CCR5, the receptor that lets HIV get inside of the cell. So if you're exposed to HIV, it's an advantage to not have this receptor. But if you're exposed to uh, certain kinds of pandemic uh, uh, strains of influenza, you really want to have CCR5. So uh, part of the book is, is really showing that it's very difficult to optimize uh, uh, genes. And it also, you know, one of the reasons I, I engage with imaginaries from the X-Men is because those movies are all, and the comic books are all about eugenics. So, so eugenics literally means good genes. And if you watch the first X-Men movie, you're introduced to a little boy um, who's taken away from his parents at a Nazi death camp in Germany at Auschwitz. And you fast forward 40 years and you meet the supervillain Magneto who sees a new genocide on the horizon. So a lot of people are familiar with the Nazi project to selectively kill certain kinds of people, but there's a new era of consumer eugenics emerging. So choices um, might soon um, 
be given to parents? You know, do you want a child with blue eyes, with white skin, with big muscles, but that might have certain health problems? You know, things like blue eyes and light skin can have some social benefits. Like in the United States, you're much less likely to get shot by a police officer if you have lighter skin. But in, in my opinion, you know, solving the problem of police violence with gene editing is, is, is the wrong approach. You know, these are very complicated social and political problems that you can't easily fix with technology. We are understanding the source code of life and there'll obviously be so many, uh, besides the challenges, these ethical and moral dilemma and questions which you know is right over there how do we go past that you know because this one side of me is excited on the possibilities of what could happen to humanity if we leverage this in a way which is beneficial to mankind but but like you said you know i mean we know so little every addition or delete del deletion of a, a specific gene has uh, so many uh, other like you know butterfly effects we, which we do not really know of but i guess I'm excited for the space for those researchers and scientists who are going beyond and asking deeper questions because when you do that, I think we go beyond rather than being, uh, you know, for the longest time, I think, be it Indians or Americans, we, we there's a religion and politics which is, you know, blinded us from or, or what we can do as a as a race so i'm excited for the possibilities yes there is uh, this whole conversation about how it could be go going into a wrong direction and i think you know whenever we talk about that i think there's always this conversation about how technology is bad and then uh, almost for, uh, with all my podcast I, I try to make this you know very clear that technology is never good or bad it's just a tool that we are leveraging it's the, the choice of how we use the technology, whether it's a good and bad, and that's when you know you you see uh, you will end up seeing a utopian or a dystopian future. Through the, while you were speaking, you mentioned that uh, the world's first genetically modified people. I, I think maybe you were hinting at uh, Yankui, he's uh, uh, Lula and Nana. Uh, were you hinting at them? Were you hinting at others which you know of, which you would like to talk about? Yeah, so maybe before we get to the experiment that happened in China in 2018 that resulted in the birth of three genetically modified babies, I can give people some background by talking about the long history of, of gene therapy research. So it, about 20 years ago, um, at the turn of the 21st century, um, the, the field of gene therapy uh, caught a lot of headlines. So there was a young man, Jesse Gilsinger, that died. He, he was relatively healthy. He had a rare genetic condition. He participated in a clinical trial and it resulted in his death. At, at that point, there had already been four, around 4,000 people who had participated in, in gene therapy clinical trials. That's 4,000 genetically modified people. Over the last 20 years, um, things have moved relatively slow. The, the precautionary principle has kind of kicked in. And, um, you know, at least until around 2015, you didn't see very many gene therapies that were getting approved. The book talks about, um, you know, some, some of the earliest um, uh, gene therapies. So, so there's a cancer drug on the market now. It's the very first approved gene therapy called Chemraya that very well could make chemotherapy obsolete. So if, if you've ever had anyone in your family go through chemotherapy, it's a horrible experience. You lose your hair, often your eyebrows, alters your brain. Um, and, you know, for, for the families that are able to access this, this can be a real life changer. So in particular, it's, it's leukemia and all kinds of blood cancers that are getting um, treated, possibly even cured with, with these new therapies. The, the big ethical dilemma is, for me, not whether or not we should alter our DNA. I, arguably, you know, chemical exposures, toxins are, are changing our DNA, often in very profound ways as well. Um, but the dilemma is about who can afford this, this treatment. So um, I went to the laboratory where they conducted the clinical trial. This is in Philadelphia, Penn Medicine. And one of the surprising things I found is that it was all white people who are getting this therapy. So leukemia 
disproportionately impacts Latin Americans, um, disproportionately impacts African Americans. But I learned that um, people weren't able to afford the basic health care, the cancer screenings that would qualify them for this clinical trial. So, um, you know, I, I, I followed one, one Asian American boy. It, it wasn't an exclusively white people. There was one um, boy whose mother was from Korea. His name is, is Nick Wilkins. And I basically tell his story in the book about how um, he got leukemia at the age of four and how um, his parents worked really hard uh, fighting insurance companies to make sure that their son would get the life-saving medical treatment that he, he needed, but also exploring new experiments that emerged. Um, the, the, the study was funded by Novartis, um, and since, since they um, announced the, the drug with a, a, an exorbitant price tag, so, so before this moment, you had some uh, drugs that were in the range of a couple hundred thousand dollars, but, but with this one, it was $450,000 for a single dose. Many people get a single dose and under, uh, undergo remission, even a cure. But it's, it's only about a 50-50 chance. So this is a, a new medicine for the elite, um, but there are different ways of, of bringing together science and justice, of, of doing gene therapy research that is fundamentally different and that uh, is more accessible for more people. To, to get access to a treatment like this leukemia therapy, you have to be in the right place, you have to be of the right race, the right class, all these things matter. So, so how can we imagine a future where it's not just about innovative uh, science, technology, and medicine, but in, innovative ways of, of engaging with the, the basic research so that you know, it's accessible to the masses? It's, it's not just a problem of figuring out the technical problems, getting something that works, and then distributing it. It's about building principles of justice and equity into the research design from the very start. There are so many challenges, and you mentioned about you know the unimaginable at this point in time you know the price point of gene therapy you know and i was reading i mean you know, for a sickle cell treatment it's somewhere around 1.5 million dollars you know and it's completely out of reach for a common man you know how to get this uh gene therapy which could like upend healthcare in the hands of everyone making it equal equitable you know democratizing it, it it's such a a, a a huge problem which i think if, if it's solved globally it could do wonders you know then there are these small you know cut through breakthrough innovators researchers who are in their little way are doing things to go beyond like Jose Zainer, I mean, doing biotech, I mean, you know, but I, I don't know whether that's the right approach. But I, I think, you know, I mean, we need more like collaborative approach and kind of break down this capitalistic structure, which is, you know, creating uh, a profit at any cost industry. Uh, now, uh, the genetically modified uh, human beings, w would you like to talk about that? Because besides the genetically modified human beings, there's obviously animals also, you know, there's there, there was this recent documentary on Netflix and how people are trying to do these glow dog and glow cats. W would you like to talk about uh, humans and animals? Yeah, so, so in the book, I, I profile a, a group of biohackers who are trying to do biotechnology different. Um, so, so one of them, uh, uh, David Aishi, has set up a shack in the back of his yard in Mississippi. So, so David's a dog breeder, um, and he has been trying to create glow-in-the-dark dogs. He's also been um, genetically modifying himself. Um, he's, he's trying to build, build his muscles. Um, but, uh, you know, people in David's group, um, another, uh, another young man named Aaron, had really high hopes for the technology. Um, Aaron told me that he wanted to be immortal. And um, he didn't really understand the science. Um, he, maybe you could uh, sort of liken him to a modern day uh, snake oil salesman. Like he, he saw the power of genetic technologies, but didn't really understand how it works. The, the tragedy of Aaron's story is that he didn't find immortality. Um, he made some out, outlandish claims about what his group could do. He said that they could cure herpes and cure cancer and that they were on that path, um, not to mention HIV. He was, he was claiming to do all of these things um, very quickly. 
but he was basically called out by the community. They said, you know, you're just full of BS. You're, you're not, you're putting people's lives at risk and, and you're not delivering any kind of concrete benefits to people. So, so Aaron actually ended up dead. He um, uh, sort of killed himself. It looks like a drug overdose. He was found up, uh, floating in a, a, a sensory deprivation tank, like a meditation tank, but he had drugs in his pocket. Um, and he didn't find immortality. Um, and meanwhile, his, his friend David Aishi was unable to create glowing, glowing dogs, which is relatively easy to do if you, know, if you have a PhD in biology and if you have a lab. It's trivial to create dogs that grow, glow green or red. It would be relatively trivial to create a human that glowed green or red. You know, these techniques have been around for more than 20 years. There was a an artist, Eduardo Cac, um, that created the, the GFP bunny, the green fluorescing protein bunny. He took a gene from a jellyfish and introduced it to, to a rabbit, or at least he hired some scientists to do that. But it's it's not that easy to do. People can get hurt, and you know some some of these um, these hacker initiatives are potentially dangerous. So, um, you, you know, I, I think some of the hacker community has the right ethos in the sense that some of those ideas about justice they've really taken on board and said, you know, we don't believe in intellectual property. We don't believe that companies like Novartis should sort of cling to this. A, a lot of the the knowledge that goes into a gene therapy is, is publicly funded knowledge. Novartis says, you know, we have to charge high prices because we need to recoup the investment that, that we put into the research. But in fact, you know, much, much of the research that goes into gene therapies is, is in the public domain. So, so smaller uh, companies and hackers are, are trying to do the same thing. But the risk is moving too fast, and the risk is taking advantage of vulnerable people, people who are vulnerable because they might have a disease and, and have high hopes for a genetic technology to transform their lives, but also people who are vulnerable because they might not have, you know, a, a, a serious amount of money or, or the educational background to understand the, the, the very serious risks um, that, that are associated with these technologies. So, yeah, I think that that delicate dance between informing people, you know, when, when you participate in an experiment, usually the, the risks greatly outweigh the benefits, the possible benefits. You don't know going into a clinical trial if there will be any, any benefit. Um, so, so yeah, a, a, a lot of mistakes and missteps and accidents happen along the way. So I think that's important that, that people appreciate that. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think, um, the hacker community is doing interesting things, but uh, you know, prudence, caution, these are all important things as, as we move forward with these new technologies. Right, yeah. you know, excitement of understanding what these technologies could do. I hope that we don't, uh, you know, do the same mistake what possibly Yankui he did and the setback it created to the entire, uh, entire industry and the com community. Uh, Gen the world's first genetically modified human beings. Would you like to talk about that? Well, let, let's talk about that. So, so the book uh, gets deep into his story and the story of the, uh, the families that um, participated in the clinical trial. Um, Dr. Ha was released from prison um, back in March, and I've been having many conversations with him. Um, you know, learning more, you know, the, the book reports um, what, what happened in the lab and what went wrong. But um, also dispels some of the uh, misinformation that is out, out there. A lot of people didn't fully understand the experiment and were making claims in the media that were totally irresponsible. So, so let me kind of start by talking about the, the families that signed up for the experiment. Um, the experiment was uh, aimed at curing HIV and creating children who would be resistant to this virus from, from birth. And, and the couples who were recruited had HIV positive fathers and HIV negative mothers. And under current Chinese law, if, if you have HIV, um, you can't use reproductive medicine in China. So, so many of the fathers wanted to have babies, um, but they couldn't do it in China. You can't get uh, IVF and vitro fertilization or a much simpler technique called sperm washing, which basically reduces the risk of, of transmitting the virus to your partner um, if, if you're trying to make a baby. Um, 
it, it turns out that, you know, these days we have new science and we, we now know that it is completely possible to safely make a baby if you're HIV positive, if you stay on your medicine and you get regular PCR tests that show the virus is undetectable. So if you can't detect the virus in your blood, you can't transmit it. But when, when this experiment was done um, in 2018, that science wasn't settled yet. And it, it, it's very difficult to get also um, reliable viral load testing. Ba basically, these couples were desperate. They had high hopes, they were vulnerable. Um, so the, the, the announcement for the experiment was circulated on social media. Um, in China, Weibo is, is, is kind of the, the main thing, Weibo and WeChat. So there was a group of HIV positive um, men um, that circulated the announcement out of Beijing. It was largely gay and bisexual men. So, so people who were living with very delicate secrets. So if, if you have HIV um, and your employer finds out, you're likely to lose your job in China. Um, not to mention the very complicated um, social stigma that goes along with being gay or bisexual in China. So, so these families were living with secrets. They wanted to have children. They didn't see any other vi viable option. Um, some some uh, HIV positive parents in China will go to places like Thailand or the United States to get reproductive medicine. The particular couples that signed up for this experiment couldn't do that. They couldn't do that because they either couldn't afford it, um, they couldn't afford the international travel. Some of them were actually uh, members of the Chinese military and members of the Chinese Communist Party. And to do international travel, um, you have to apply for a passport if, if you're a, a member of, of the party or the military, and you have to have a clear reason. And they didn't have a, a, a good reason that they could use. Um, so for the couples, for the parents, this re represented the profound hope of a, a, a very simple hope of having a child. And, and many of them also were excited about the fundamental idea, the idea that they might participate in an experiment um, that, that could cure HIV. They, they wanted to have children. They would never have to live with the social stigma. I, I think one interesting dimension to this experiment is that it wasn't addressing a medical problem so much. So in, in China, like Europe and the United States, possibly India too, if you have HIV, it's no longer a serious illness. It's different from AIDS. AIDS only emerges if you don't have access to, to good, highly, act highly active antiretroviral therapy. There's very good therapies available. So, so in many ways, it, it was addressing a social need, the social need of people who have HIV to have a child. And I, I think in the same way, you know, I, I talked earlier about how gene editing is not going to solve the, the problem of police violence. I don't think, you know, people should get white skin because they want to avoid getting shot in the United States. And similarly in China, I don't think gene editing is the best solution for the social problem of, of people living with HIV who want to have children. It would be much easier, may, maybe not easier in a political sense, but, you know, in terms of a risk and benefit sense, like, let's change the policy. Let's make, let's make a world where HIV positive men can safely have children without having to participate in, in risky experiments. So, so some of the ethical missteps in this experiment that I detail in the book and some of the, the serious problems are, are different from what the media got excited about. The media got excited about like, is this ethical? Like, can is it responsible to fundamentally alter DNA? For me, again, it's it's not a big deal. Uh, you know, we're, DNA is getting altered all the time. Every baby is born with thirty to forty mutations that its parents didn't have. By the time we're middle aged, we have you know anywhere between four thousand and four hundred thousand mutations in a given skin cell. For me, it's not such a big deal to genetically modify a child. But where Dr. Ha went wrong, first of all, he wasn't a medical doctor. And this is ultimately how he was charged with a crime in China. He was charged with medical malpractice. Um, he, he was also uh, sentenced uh, because he harmed these families. Um, it was unknown at the time, I reported it for the first time in my book, that these children were not healthy as any other babies, as Dr. Ha claimed on YouTube. Uh, they were in fact born very prematurely at 31 weeks. 
The complexity is that it's probably not, you know, it's hard to tell, but it's, it's probably not from an unknown risk of CRISPR. So if you have an IVF baby, if you have a twin, um, you're very likely to have a premature birth. These are known risks of established technologies. One of the, one of the places that he made a, a critical misstep was trying to implant twins. If, if you go to most IVF doctors these days, if you go to international congresses and conferences on, on gynecology, you'll learn that it's not responsible to implant more than one embryo at a time in, 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 into, into a woman um, for the purposes of pregnancy. If Dr. Ha had been a specialist in reproductive medicine, he would have known this, but he was, he was a biophysicist. So um, that was a critical misstep. Um, and you know, also the research wasn't safety first in the sense that he was implanting embryos in, into women, you know, multiple embryos and multiple women all at once. It wasn't, you know, very slowly, let's see how this experiment unfolds. Let's see if there, there's a healthy outcome at birth, and then let's move to the next stage. It, it was kind of chaotic. Um, so, you know, those, those are some of the critical missteps as, as I see them. And um, I, I still think that there's a lot to learn from this experiment. Um, you know, the, the children, as best as I can tell, and I'm probably better informed than just about everyone right now, you know, there's Dr. Ha and there's the people around him, and I've been learning what they learn, um, they've learned over the last three years, and, and these children are, are growing up into normal toddlers, you know, now they're almost four years old, they'll be four years old uh, in, in October, and, uh, you know, What's the big deal? <laughs> you know, but but we don't know uh, if the basic science uh, is going to show if this experiment worked. So, amidst the controversy and amidst Dr. Huss, I, I, I think one of the other missteps he made was putting business and capitalism ahead of the safety of these individual children. So, I learned that after the births, instead of doing the science, instead of, you know, he, he took blood samples at birth from the umbilical cord, easy test. You can take the HIV virus, try to introduce it to those cells, see if those cells are resistant to HIV. He didn't do that. Instead, he was more focused on setting up new business deals and new clinics. So he went to the Hainan province of China, which is known for medical tourism. He gave the governor's office a proposal for a new clinic that would have, um, you know, a massive facility where people would would do this, and and it would be kind of a teaching hospital and a place where medical tourists could come from around the world. He went to California. He went to Beijing. He was drumming up investment and, and support from politicians rather than focusing on the health and and well being of, of the children and the basic science. So the basic science remains to be done. I think it should be done. I think his data should be published. And um, part of my conversations with him right now are, are focusing on how, how we might build, you know, the groundwork for that, that science getting published, but more importantly, how we might build a framework to protect the health and well-being of these three individual children that resulted from the experiment. Lovely. How cool is that? Really appreciate you sharing the complete inside view rather than the exterior, uh, you know, news that we all all get. Uh, IVF when it you know when, when it was first introduced, I think the entire world went bonkers. You know, right from the religion, uh, religious uh, religions, and and everyone, nobody wanted. It. In fact, uh, the second I IVF baby was created in India by an Indian, and, and he was ostracized, and he had to commit suicide. So, I, you know, th like, like you said, those missteps, if it was done right, he could have had a Nobel Prize, you know, rather than running behind uh, the, 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 the money, he would have run, run behind the science. He would have been in, in, in the news uh, for someone who's created science, which has really created impact. Because, you know, I take a very objective view rather than a subjective view, you know, because... You know, there are desperate people around the world, you know, with, with uh, desperate health conditions, you know, and, and these things offer a ray of hope, you know, for the us, the normal people, it, it's very easy to have these conversations and debate that, oh, should that person have had it or shouldn't they have had done it? I think if you would be sitting in the person who possibly disabled or has an HIV and, uh, and, and, he, I'm sure he or she will only think about the kids. So yes, I mean, yeah, 
I wish it would have been a more uh, science first rather than uh, you know running behind. So so there are people who are at the cutting edge doing some really uh, forward things and some playing around, tinkering with some really cool things. George Church being one of them who is trying to bring back the extinct mammoth. Would you like to talk about the possibilities, you know, of this exciting technology when when it kind of matures? What would be like those big questions or things that you really are looking forward to happen once it uh, this th- this tech really matures? Well, I guess one of my questions is how can we modify ourselves in responsible ways to address these new uncertain times that we're living in? And in my mind, the project by George Church to take the the woolly mammoth out of the permafrost and give it new life is really out of sync with the world right now we're living through global warming we're we're living in a time where elephants um in in places that are hot um are unable to find ways of coexisting with people there's intense human wildlife conflicts in, in many parts of the globe especially where elephants are where people are trying to raise crops at the same time they're trying to value conservation. Um, I I think there's also a danger in seeing technology as an easy fix to the problem of extinctions. It doesn't matter if if an animal goes extinct. We'll just store it in a bank. We'll print print a new one if if it does go extinct. But what kinds of futures are we going to be living with? And what kinds of, of risky and innovative changes might we make to the human that might better prepare us for a, a planet of radically altered ecologies? So one of the thinkers I feature in the book talks about um, what it might be like to care for butterflies on a damaged planet. Um, so she she talks about, um, she imagines in, in the sort of vein of, of speculative fiction, um, a child who decides to modify itself to be more like a butterfly so that it can sense the world like a butterfly, so that it can learn about what the butterfly's life world looks like. In particular, she's interested in monarch butterflies that depend on a plant in the United States called milkweed. But her, her story is, is, is a story of risk, a story of, of humans making change to themselves to better care for another species. But it's ultimately a story of failure. Um, in, in this in this imagined world, the butterflies go extinct, and the modified humans are, are left to do the work of of mourning their failures. So, you know, how can we imagine ways that technology might enable us to live with these problematic futures? You know, maybe we want to live underwater. Maybe that's maybe that's a near future possibility. Like like in this era of you know, rising sea levels of, of perpetual floods. Maybe there's new niches for what we might call post-humans underwater. Maybe we're going to have to learn, uh, uh, you know, to live with more extreme heat. You know, maybe there's there's ways of modifying ourselves, subtle genetic changes that'll let you survive if it gets above, you know, 30, 40 degrees for sustained periods of time. So, so I think, you know, between utopia and dystopia, there's uses for these technologies that do open up future possibilities. But again, I, I like to come back to questions of, you know, who's benefiting from these technologies? Is it just the elite who are going to be able to afford to, to make precision, you know, changes to either make themselves better off with the medical conditions of today? or better able to live in a world of tomorrow? Or, you know, are, are we gonna democratize access to these technologies? And is it all about humans? I, I think George Church's project is interesting in, in a sense because it's kind of decentering the focus away from people. But, you know, if, if we created a woolly mammoth, it, it would be sort of an orphan. It would be a creature without a world. It would, it would be a creature that doesn't have a place as, as, as the climate changes. So, so how might we think about other kinds of conservation strategies, other, other practices of, of living with endangered life that is more about responding to the world as it is now and as it might be? So maybe, you know, an, an, an elephant that's well adapted to living in hot environments, maybe their range can move north. How can we, how can we think about rewilding experiments that 
um, yeah, aren't just about technology saving the day, because it won't by itself. These are much more complicated problems. But how can we think about the issues related to ecology, disease, society, poverty? Like, how can we think about all these things together to imagine a lively and uh, a lively future that is full of justice for for people and justice for multiple other species? Right. Uh, there's so many big questions in in front of us. You know, there's this this flood of all of these awesome technologies which is just coming in you know i mean we just understanding artificial intelligence quantum computing biotechnology genetic editing and once it actually comes in uh, that, that we will have a tool to kind of tinker around and create applications which will really really transform mankind but then on the other side we need to you know ask that deep question who are we do we actually need that can we create a better world maybe just without technology can we create a world where we we accept everyone and not running behind creating but the same although let's create uh, you know white males with blue eyes you know so yes we, we we are posing these deep questions and i hope and i wish that we take the right path and the right path which is collaborative keeping our uniqueness there rather than creating creating one one specific thing my last question to you what comes next for mr eben kirksey and paint a picture what do you think the world will look like in the next 10 years and maybe talk about the 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 applications which through genetic editing which will impact the world yeah so turning to viruses lately in part because um you know there's things that are emerging in the realm of synthetic biology you know there's been a lot of hype about CRISPR, but if, if you look at the, the applications that are emerging in um, medical fields and conservation fields, um, you know, in basic molecular biology, viruses are doing a, many more interesting things than CRISPR. Like CRISPR can, you know, again, break something, but if like it, it can cut basically, but the, the pasting work is, is all done by viruses. So there's things called lentivirus viruses, basically a modified HIV virus that can load new genes on, onto you. Um, these are being used in these, these uh, gene therapies, but the, it, you, you could develop a broad suite of, of viruses that are infectious, that are easy to spread, that could spread good, so-called good genes. But again, what is a good gene? What is a bad gene? I, I look towards, um, uh, you know, science fiction worlds like the wind-up girl from, uh, uh, Tong Chai uh, uh, set in Southeast Asia, looking looking at technologies that might enable us to transition beyond petrochemical capitalism. Like we we know collectively that the system is broken, right? We we know collectively that if we keep burning fossil fuels, um, we'll be underwater. Poor people will be, be flooded. Extreme temperatures, fires, like that that is happening. Like it's it's the world of today. Um, but it's a world that will get intensified tomorrow. Um, I'm also interested in viruses because we've just lived through a pandemic, um, because it, it, it was really interesting to see the way that the sense of the modern bubble was, was undermined in a radical way, in a way that many people weren't able to imagine by this, this emergent disease. So, so how do we live with viruses? How do we live with ongoing disruptions, whether those disruptions are floods or extreme heat or a, a new disease? And, and I think, you know, it's, it's often people who are, who are on the margins, who have long-term strategies of, of survival, who have lived through previous disasters, whether they be a natural disaster like a flood or a political disaster like colonialism. Like, how do we learn from, from these accumulated um, historical experiences and move forward? So, yeah, I, I'm uh, all about expecting the unexpected, um, you know, expecting a new kind of calamity that we might not even imagine. You know, this, this, is, this seemed kind of abstract until uh, 20, 2020. Um, but I'm also interested in the ways that we can latch on to concrete figures of hope, things, things that might be biotechnical, that might be, um, you know, political, like, like how, how do we assemble the right um, collection of, of technology ideas and people 
to uh, really pursue that idea of science and justice. So there's, there's no easy answer. And indeed the idea of justice is, is wide open, right? So there's the kind of justice that emerges with the law. There's the kind of justice that's more social justice, or you could talk about environmental justice or, or ecological justice. So, you know, for me, that's that's where the hope emerges. It's it's not kind of waiting on technologists to de to develop something that's going to save the world, but how to take existing technologies off the shelf, use them in new and surprising ways, but but ways that um, are you know continually asking that question of of who benefits or qui bono. So so how do we how do we um, bring technology, politics, and social values together in new kinds of ways to bring the futures that we want. That's that's kind of my final final vision for, for this this conversation. Lovely. Hey, Ibn, thank you for being part of the podcast. Really appreciate you sharing your insights. I've learned so much about uh, the, the, the cutting edge of technology, your, your conversations with Yanko Ihi and the, the possible future of humanity, where it, it might go. It's exciting as well as scary. I hope that the listeners play a role somehow in, you know, educating the, themselves, you know, and being aware about what's going on in the world and raising a voice against the wrongs and trying to nudge and nurture what is the right way, you know, where we all should go towards, you know, that's my hope and that's my wish and that's the reason I do the podcast. So thank you, really appreciate this. And to my listeners, if you like what you see in here, then please press the subscribe button until next time. See you guys. Thank you. Really thank you so much, Eddie. It's been, been a delight.